This century Jerusalem was not among his own people. He was as much a foreigner as an Irishman in London or a Texan in New York. His accent would immediately mark him as not one of us, and all the communal prejudice of the supposedly uh, superior culture of the capital city would stand against his claim to be heard even as a prophet, let alone as a messiah, which everyone, a title which everyone knew belonged to, to, to Judea. And of course the question uh, then flows from that, how did this affect Jesus, the Galilean rabbi? Well, there were Galilean rabbis as well. I've just cited the example of Yesay uh, the Galilean. There was a famous uh, healer in the first century called Hanan of Mendoza. He was from uh, Galilee. So it was not un unheard of. In fact, I'm sure there were many rabbis, even prominent rabbis coming from Galilee. Uh, but one gets the impression that no matter what they said or did, no matter what Jesus said or did, no matter what he achieved, he'd never quite shake the stigma in the eyes of the Judean elite of somehow being the rough and ready Galilean and how right can he be and he'll never quite be one, one of us. Of course, Galilee was not all bad. In fact, there were some things that were downright beneficial about it. Here the rabbis had a saying that if a person wishes to be rich, let him go north. If he wants to be wise, let him come south. Now, what did that mean? Although Judea might have been the spiritual center of the nation, from the point of view of farming or fertility, it suffered by comparison with Galilee. There's just a picture of modern day Galilee. Um, Galilee, by contrast, had much to commend it in terms of arable land and fertile soil. It was a very attractive prospect for farmers. It also had the Sea of Galilee, which was a major fishing center. A number of fish towns and fish villages had sprung up around the shores of Galilee, the most famous of which was Capernaum, which, where Jesus would settle as an adult. Um, on top of that, the cost of living in Galilee was one-fifth of what it was down in Judea. So no surprise that whether or not uh, Ju Jerusalem was the center of the land, many people trekked north for a better life. Right, before we get into the realities of everyday life in Nazareth, uh, we're going to take a look at the class structure as it existed in the ancient world. Now, in our modern West, it's customary to speak of three classes, upper class, middle class, and lower class. Now, when we go to ancient Israel, uh, somewhat surprising, but we can actually make a similar claim, uh, but we must define very carefully what we mean by those terms. We can speak of an upper, middle, and lower class, but we've got to define and specify those terms very carefully. First of all, understandably, there was an upper class. Uh, that would have uh, pertained to uh, Herod, the, the family of the Herods, his extended family, the very wealthy high priestly families, probably the Pharisees as well, who were uh, usually extremely rich, extremely well off. Uh, they would have comprised between 5 and 7 percent of the population. Israel also had what might be called a middle class, but here we must define it very carefully. In our modern age, when we speak of middle class, uh, we generally, very broadly speaking, we think immediately of uh, someone with a flat screen TV, got, got a pension and medical scheme sorted out, a decent job, reasonably comfortable, and so forth. 2,000 years ago, all that middle class meant is that you weren't a peasant, you were somewhat above a peasant, but you were by no means secure. Um, all that separated you from peasant status was one bad season. There were no welfare safety nets, there was no human rights culture, there was nothing like that one bad season and you could be right, right down there with the peasants. Now for the most important class as far, as far as the Gospels are concerned, uh, the so-called lower class. This class comprised of somewhere between 70 and 90 percent of the population. So our, our middle class in the modern West only really started coming to the fore in the late 1700s, early 1800s. It coincided with uh, tremendous uh, efforts in, in, in social welfare uh, programs and uh, free market capitalism, capitalist projects, opportunities, um, and so we have a very healthy middle class in, in the West today. Um, but 2,000 years ago, those who might have been middle class today were pretty much, would be pretty much relegated to the, to the peasant class, and so between 70 and 90 percent uh, were, were pretty much the, uh, the, peasant, the peasant class. They would have consisted of day laborers, day laborers, menial workers, and the downright unemployed, of which there were many. Now, this peasant class was given a special name. The rabbis called them the Amha Aretz, and that's a term that literally means people of the land or people of the soil. 
Uh, Aretz is the very common Hebrew word for earth or land. Uh, Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The word earth is Aretz. Uh, the word ha uh, just means the. So putting it all together, the Amha Aretz are the, uh, the people of the land, the people of the soil. It was a derogatory term. It was a, usually used by, by the rabbis uh, in, a, in a negative sense. And uh, to this end, the Talmud records some uh, rather garish quotes about the, uh, about the poor old Amha Aretz. One rabbi read, Greater is the hatred of the Amha Aretz for the learned than the hatred of the Gentiles for Israel. So in other words, the Gentiles hate Israel, but uh, the Amha Aretz hate the learned classes, hate the upper classes even more. So one can sense a tremendous rift between the, the upper classes and the, and the lower classes. Uh, the rabbi Hillel was known to be a very lenient rabbi, uh, a little too lenient. Uh, in fact, he's quite an interesting character. He died in 110 AD. He's supposed to have lived to over 100. There's a chance that Jesus might have met him, I stress might, uh, because in 100... Yes, he would have died in 10 AD. He lived to be 110, died in 10 AD. Uh, there's a chance Jesus would have known him. I stress a chance because... Um, uh, Jesus, of course, would have been 13 years old at that, at that stage. Uh, we read in the Gospels that uh, Jesus, or Jesus amazed the teachers at the temple, teachers of the law at the temple with his great wisdom, with his great learning. And it's just possible, I stress, possible that Hillel might have been among them. Uh, Hillel, one of the most influential rabbis of his time. Anyway, he had this to say about the poor old Amharitz. He said, they have no conscience and they were anything but human. So uh, again, an extremely uh, elitist view of the poor old peasants. There's a very famous quote, a very celebrated quote from the Talmud that shows not only the relative pecking order in Jewish society, but also exactly where the Amaharet stood in the overall economy. Basically, the list pertains to uh, what an eligible bachelor should be looking for uh, if he's seeking out the, an eligible bachelorette in ancient Israel. And the list goes something like this. Our rabbis taught that a man always sell all he has and marry the daughter of a scholar. Uh, so in other words, if you're looking for the ideal eligible bachelorette, uh, you would seek out the daughter of a scholar. If you achieved that, you had arrived, you had turned heads, you were pretty much set for life. But if you couldn't land at the daughter of a scholar, all was not lost, you were still okay, because you could still find a daughter of one of the great men of the generation. And uh, if you landed a daughter of one of the great men of the generation, no doubt Hillel and Shammai would qualify in that category, you would still arrived. And the list goes down. Uh, the daughter of the head of a synagogue was still pretty prominent. Um, in the, uh, the most famous head of a synagogue in the Gospels is Jairus. Jesus heals, uh, raises his daughter from, from the dead. Uh, the heads of synagogues were fairly prominent people. Uh, daughter of a city treasurer still okay. Elementary school teacher still okay. But the very last category, uh, extremely derogatory, but let him not marry the daughter of an Amha Aretz, people of the land, because if you married uh, a daughter of a daughter of a peasant, uh, they, because they are detestable, and of their daughters, as I said, cursed be the one who lies with any manner of beast. So, um, pretty nasty, and no doubt said in jest, not, not literally, but um, yeah, just to show you exactly where the Amha Aretz stood. Uh, so just to bring that again to Jesus, where would he have stood in the social hierarchy, this, this uh, very prominent upper class, this very wobbly middle class, and the massive sprawling peasant class? Uh, the Gospels give one or two uh, clues as to where he might have stood. First of all, the Gospel of Luke. We read, when the time of their purification according to the law of Moses had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him, the baby Jesus, to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. And that was a Jewish law that when a baby was born, an appropriate offering had to be made at the temple. And that, of course, is drawn from the book of Leviticus, so let's get further insight on that. Leviticus 18. When the days of her purification for a son or daughter were over, she is to bring to the priest at the entrance to the tent of meeting a year-old lamb for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or dove. Goes on, if she cannot afford a lamb, she is to bring two doves or two young pigeons, one for a burnt offering, the other for a sin offering. 
So it is a question of cost, a question of what one could afford. If you could afford a lamb, you bought that. If you were rich, if you were poor, however, you bought a pair of doves or a pair of pigeons. And we read in the Luke account that Mary bought the doves and pigeons, which indicates that Mary and Joseph were part of the, uh, the peasant class, part of the, the Amha Aretz. On the other hand, some scholars have tried to throw curved balls at that. Uh, some might say, what about the gift of gold that the Magi brought to the baby Jesus? Of course, they bought very exotic gifts, uh, gold, frankincense, and, and myrrh. Uh, exotic frankincense and myrrh probably came from Arabia. Um, and what about the gold? Maybe the gold would have helped to set Joseph and Mary up. Maybe they were actually higher than the, uh, than the peasant class. Somebody else raised the point, what about the city of Sepphoris, which I mentioned just now? which lay very close to Nazareth. We know from history that the city of Sepphoris was being raised up, it was being rebuilt uh, when Jesus was a boy. And uh, of course, being built up, they would have needed artisans and builders to, to help with that. And maybe Joseph and his son Jesus would have gone across and helped with the rebuilding of Sepphoris. And one scholar deduces from that that it might even have pushed Joseph up to the level, to the level of the lower middle class, at least for a while. So all these curved balls being thrown at it. But I think we can probably say that uh, Joseph and his family were on the lower end of the, of the economic spectrum. And of course, we can ask again how this affects Jesus' status as a rabbi, uh, being not only from Galilee, but also from peasant stock. Um, in a way, we might have been surprised if God had not chosen Galilee in which to have his son brought up. 1 Corinthians tells us that God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong, the lowly things of the world, and the despised things. And we can see a broad context coming out there. Jesus is born into a poor family, associates with outcasts, and later rejected by family and friends. And we see the heart of God c coming out there. At another point, Jesus says, learn from me, I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for, for your souls. So we see that the very gentle, humble heart of Jesus, he reaches out to the outcasts, touches the lepers, and I think there's something being said, being said there. I think we can learn something.